see at the bottom right, but I can't find it there. Um, <laughs> uh, you can give it uh, from the full screen, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, is that uh, look all right? No, no, actually, uh, we can see your comments as well. What you need to do is, uh, uh, can you go back? Yeah, one second. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, I don't like the speed, but I will. Yep. Uh, well, what you need to do is go down oh. and there's an option to, yeah, that one. Okay. And uh, can, you, can you see my notes? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now it's fine. Uh, okay. Good. Yeah. Good Thank morning. you. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, uh, Dr. Zbinek, uh, the head of the Tropical uh, Ethnobotany Lab has joined from CZ. Oh, I, I guess you, I think you have met him before. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that we, I'm sure that we have met, maybe at SCB or or somewhere similar. Yeah, yeah, at at SCB and uh, some yeah, few times we we met. Nice to meet. Nice yeah. to see you again, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> So I thought I uh, uh, so I talk for about forty minutes yeah. uh, to allow um, time yeah. for for questions yeah, yeah. after. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can stop sharing. Uh, I can. Uh, ask I can. Thank you. Uh, so, so we'll um, just wait for some more participants. Start in five five minutes. Yep. So sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the time now? Uh, for for us, it's uh, eleven twenty. Yeah, in three minutes we can return. Sure. Yeah. Okay. We have time for three minutes. Hmm. Uh, before we uh, start uh, for the participants that have joined a few housekeeping rules if you kindly go on mute so that there's no disturbance when the speaker is giving uh, his talk thank you hello everyone who has joined uh, from all over the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. We will begin shortly. I can see that, Mark, you have an amazing uh, office over there with full of botanical collections. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's one of the offices we work in.
Mr. Nadzim, you can start. Yeah, uh, just uh, one more minute, sir. I'm just receiving a few mails that they are going to join. Okay. Uh, so can we start? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hello and welcome uh, everyone uh, to the Global Expo Botany Research Webinar Series guest lecture number nine. Uh, we're very happy for uh, participants across the world who have registered for this talk uh, and we welcome you. And uh, to begin with, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Nishan Gurav and I'm a PhD student at the a tropical botany and ethnobiology lab at the Czech University of Life Sciences, Prague. And uh, this uh, webinar has been um, organized by the Center for Conservation of Natural Resources, the University of Transdisciplinary Health Sciences and Technology, Bangalore, India, and uh, the Tropical Botany and Ethnobiology Lab, Faculty of Tropical Agri Sciences, Czech University of Life Sciences, Prague. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the Global Ethnobotany Webinar Series uh, was started uh, with an intention to bring together uh, uh, ethnobotanists, botanists uh, across the world together and share uh, their research uh, with youngsters and uh, uh, researchers interested in the subject so that we can all come together and uh, uh, you know explore uh, the different uh, quality research that has been taking place in this field and uh, uh, to create a platform for youngsters to reach out to researchers like Mark, uh, who have been uh, doing fascinating work uh, for their uh, uh, research career, during their research career. So uh, let me begin by um, welcoming Mark. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much for your time. And I now request um, uh, Dr. Karim to give a small introduction about uh, Professor Mark uh, before beginning his talk. Over to you, Dr. Karim. Thank you, Nishan. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, we have all uh, from all part of the world joined to today to hear about uh, uh, Dr. Mark's talk. Many, when, the moment when I have advertised it, uh, uh, I could hear a lot of people saying that we need to attend this and uh, they asked the links, that sort of thing I could uh, see from the entire thing. And so uh, as a, uh, on behalf of uh, TDU, CCNR Center, and on behalf of Tribe, I'd like to welcome uh, Mark for this uh, program who agreed to uh, give some time for our researchers all over the world to, uh, uh, to, to know about the topic that he has uh, given. So Dr. Mark is a curator of the Economic Botany Collection and a senior research leader for the interdisciplinary research at the Royal Botanical Garden Q. He's also a visiting professor in geography and the department uh, and Royal Holy University of London. And his research interest, uh, uh, I mean, his research interest is on people and plant. And he has visited in many collections, the current projects of 19th century ethnobotanical collections uh, is also a lot. You can see during his presentation how he takes this entire uh, collection towards the historical Medina Medica, how he's going to put in. You can really hear that. Uh, and he also works uh, with uh, different colleagues on arts of humanity, research across different parts in queue. And, and he's also author of uh, more than 100 publications uh, on natural history. Uh, and also, uh, he's uh, I could say that uh, uh, in, in this era, the case studies of uh, from Q and elsewhere, which illustrates the opportunity of methodologically the challenges of collaborative research with source and communities. And uh, TDU is also working with him in certain projects uh, which we have uh, visualized and uh, tried to work. I mean, we are working also with Mark and and uh, with and team with this. 
And with this uh, introduction, uh, I would request Mark uh, uh, to, to, to start the presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sir. Uh, a few, a couple of um, housekeeping uh, rules. Uh, I request all the participants to kindly be on mute uh, when uh, Professor Mark is giving his talk so that we can listen to him uh, carefully and there's no disturbance. I will uh, stop sharing. Uh, Professor Mark, uh, you can share your screen now. Uh, okay, how does that look? Yeah. Yes, we can right. see it, please. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. So, so thank you very much uh, for the invitation to to speak to you. And uh, it's a, a particular pleasure to be meeting so many of you from around the world uh, at a time where, you know, for nearly two years now, we we've, we've been missing uh, some of those uh, meetings. Um, so, I thought I would perhaps start by explaining a little bit about how I came to be where I am, especially for those of you who are, are students and, and thinking about. Your, your future careers. Uh, and I, I have to say my, my career is an accidental career. Uh, I didn't plan to be where I am at, at the beginning, but there is a, I think a couple of common threads uh, to, to it. Uh, so I started being interested in the interactions between plants and people quite young at school. I was lucky to go to school that had a farm, uh, farmed by 19th century technology, that got me interested in agricultural botany. It was always plants and not uh, always plants and not animals uh, for me. Um, and that led me to Reading University, where I studied agricultural botany at that time with the idea of going to agricultural research. But I went to a talk by uh, a very uh, excellent um, archaeologist who worked on Iron Age farming in Britain, uh, realised that the same knowledge that I have been learning for agricultural botany today could be applied to the past. And so for the following 15 years or so, I worked mainly in Southwest Asia, in Turkey, Bahrain, Iraq, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, looking at the beginnings of farming and its subsequent uh, evolution. Uh, so always with that theme of, of plants and people. And I did a master's and, and a PhD at uh, University College London. Uh, I had a couple of postdocs afterwards, and then quite by chance, I saw a job advertised at Kew. My PhD had been based at Kew, so I knew a little bit about the organisation. And for more or less the first 10 years of my job, I've been here 22 years now, I worked on a whole range of useful plant projects, including a big a uh, community project working with British Asian communities, looking at the connections between South Asia, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh and Britain, where his story is told through plants. And that was a big uh, web-based uh, project. But for the last 15 years, I've mainly been working with the Economic Botany Collection, uh, partly as a creator, so partly responsible for the day-to-day -day work of the, of the collection. But today, I, these days, I share that work with, with Ben Hill, who really leads in that work as collections manager. And my interest has been moving more and more towards not only research into the collection, but actually interdisciplinary research across Q and how arts and humanities can have a really important role to play in a science institution uh, such as Kew Gardens. Uh, and in June uh, this year, my group uh, was renamed uh, Interdisciplinary Research, uh, really marking that transition at Kew from perhaps this kind of work being an activity linked to one collection to being an activity you can do across all of Kew's work. Of course, that recognises that there's no way that you can study plants in any part of the world without involving people. There are no wildernesses, there are no uh, untouched places. Anywhere you go where people are living, the plant community results from uh, human uh, activities. And so in order to work with plants, you need to work with people who work with people. You need scientists and you need humanities scholars working together. That's maybe my sort of core uh, message uh, of this talk. 
And what I'm going to do is take some case studies of work we've done in the last five years, uh, just a selection of the projects here, to illustrate how you can do that work, how you can walk into any historic collection. And we should remember, of course, that colonial collections exist not only in colonial capitals, in Brussels, in Paris, in London, uh, in New York, uh, but also in formerly colonized countries themselves. So there's a big legacy of historic collections all over the world in almost all countries. So I've chosen it as a broad title, so our 19th century botanical collections relevant to the 21st century. But I'm going to talk about one subset of uh, botanical collections within that. And that's what in the past was called the economic botany collection. And remember, in the past, in the 19th century, economic had a different meaning. It simply meant practical or useful. So economic botany collection is a collection of useful plants. Uh, today, we would probably call it an ethnobotany collection, really shifting the emphasis away from the uh, economic or utilitarian aspects of the plants and more towards the a people element, or we might call it a biocultural collection, uh, which really reflects our understanding if you're talking about the interaction between people and plants or, or humans and nature. Uh, but you have to consider biology and culture together. If you're talking about conservation, nature conservation, you have to think about cultural conservation and biological conservation together. These are always uh, firmly interlinked. So economic botany collections, ethnobotany collections, biocultural collections, all the same things, slightly different perspectives. So what do I mean by economic botany collection? What, what does it look like? And I hope that my next slide will show you what it looks like. Ah, okay. Um, and so these are some of the items in the collection at Kew. And what you can see here is some of the uh, fibres and medicinal plants. Uh, note here the blue circle on the, the jar. This shows it comes from the Indo Museum, the old East India Company Museum in London. I'll talk more about that later in our work with uh, TDU. I've uh, got more medicinal plants here used for training pharmacists. Uh, we have an ebony uh, comb uh, here. We have a bark cloth uh, shirt from the Amazon. I'll talk more about that project. Uh, Australian indigenous spear thrower. Uh, walking sticks here showing the, an uprooted uh, young palm tree. And then the root is polished to make the handle of the walking stick. And this is a very typical feature of the economic botany collection, where you have the raw material and the finished product. Makes it a little bit different to say an art museum. Here we have uh, some Indian uh, naturally dyed fabrics uh, made by children in an orphanage, so learning a skill, learning a craft. Uh, here we have a lace spark fan from Jamaica, and here's the raw lace spark, this amazing natural lace that you can tease out from the bark of the ghetto, the ghetto. Again, the raw material and the finished product. Um, these fibers sandwiched in cardboard, uh, our stinging nettle fibres extracted in Britain in the Second World War. And then we have also, amongst the 100,000 or so specimens at Kew, about 40,000 of those are wood specimens, including these turned woods here. And all of this is 19th century material. So... Kew's Museum of Economic Botany was founded in 1847. As far as we know, it was the first such distinct museum of this kind in the world. It was the earliest science collection at Kew. It's founded you know, before the herbarium and before the library. Uh, and William Hooker, the director of Kew, who set it up, was uh, had a, a vision, had a, a mission statement for the museum. But its focus would be on the practical uses and applications of the study of botany, uh, its services to, to mankind. What would it contain? Any kind of useful or curious, in other words, ethnographic vegetable product, uh, particularly things that you couldn't show in the gardens uh, and you couldn't show in the herbarium. And you'll all be familiar with the herbarium, you know, where we store flat pressed plants. That's a very uh, um, compact method of storage, but it's a very inflexible method of storage. And so one of our challenges in the collection of this kind is, in fact, a huge diversity of shapes and sizes that specimens come in. And who was this museum for? And there were 
really two audiences. One was the general public, and this museum was very popular at Kew Gardens in 19th century London. At times, William Hooker complained it was uh, so full of members of the public, but he couldn't get in himself. Uh, but his main target audiences were the scientific botanist, the merchant, the manufacturer, the physician, the chemist, the druggist, the dyer, in other words, the, the manufacturers. And essentially, the purpose of that Museum of Economic Botany was to be the interface between producers around the world, for example, uh, cotton or indigo producers in India, uh, and consumers manufacturers in Britain, taking into account that the Industrial Revolution started in Britain and in the 19th century had a huge industrial capacity. Um, but was behind this uh, often openly stated uh, economic model around buying raw materials cheap, exporting manufactured products expensive. Um, Economic, economic historians uh, still debate whether that model really worked uh, or not. Uh, and many museums around the world have their origins as what were often called commercial museums or industrial museums, as this interface between producers and uh, consumers. Uh, but that will come a little bit to the, what happened to that museum in the future a little bit later. And the museums really grew at, at Kew. So starting with Museum Number no. Two in 1847, we moved to Museum Number no. One, a big museum built uh, ten years later. Um, uh, a, a timber museum in the Orangery at Kew, now a cafe if you know Kew at all, went on to the Museum of British Forestry in 1910, the last museum to open and the last museum to shut. In the 1980s, uh, all of these museums closed and the collections were moved into a purpose-built research store where they sit today in the St. Joseph Banks building. And you can see some of the modern storage there. So a real shift away from everything being on public display to now nothing being in public display. And this is kind of one of the challenges for a curator that because we don't have an attached gallery, uh, we do lend to many other exhibitions, but that has really led us down the, how do you use the collection for research? Of course, Kew Gardens is a major research institute, about 350 scientists are working here, and all of the collections play a really important part in supporting that research. Well, this was such a good idea, but it caught on worldwide, uh, particularly in, if you like, importing cities. So in New York, in Hamburg, in, in London, in Paris, either places where products in the world were coming in or places that were centers for uh, brokering, uh, for, for the purchase of these raw materials and for scientific research into them. And so far, uh, Caroline Cornish, who's done a great deal of work on the history of the economic botany collection, whose PhD was on the subject, um, uh, we found around about 50 galleries or museums that we could specifically identify as economic botany collections. Uh, most of those have disappeared for reasons that I'll talk about, but some have survived. Uh, so of course, some of the best examples is the uh, botany galleries at the Indian Museum in Kolkata. Uh, absolutely fantastic uh, collection and display, uh, still very much in use, still really popular with uh, visitors. Uh, the Museum of Economic Botany in Adelaide, Botanic Garden has been beautifully restored and is a really good example of how you can take historic collections and by clever lighting and clever thematic displays really bring these back to life. These are not dusty, out of date old collections. These uh, really speak to people because of that connection through use and topics such as sustainability. Uh, the Missouri Botanic Garden, uh, like uh, quite a few collections, the collection was lost in the 1960s. So in the 1950s and 1960s, these uh, plant products seemed very old fashioned. They went uh, out of style. Uh, synthetic products, plastics, oil seemed to be the way of the future. And these economic botany collections started to disappear. Some were destroyed, uh, some were split into other collections. Collections. Uh, many were put into basements or attics where you couldn't easily see them any longer. 
And then uh, another example in Britain, Warrington Museum between Liverpool and Manchester, a, a small town museum. Uh, but when you step into that gallery, the Botany Gallery in Warrington, it's like stepping into a Kew Museum 150 years ago. It's a really uh, amazing experience. Uh, one of the exciting developments in the last 20 years has, of course, been, as you all know, as ethnobotanists, the revival of interest in natural products. Now they're cool. Plants are cool. Sustainability is cool. And that has led to a revival in ethnobotany or biocultural collections. And here you can see, just by the way, that the Missouri Museum is an exact copy of that first Q Museum, if you compare the engraving uh, and the photograph. And that Henry Shaw, the founder of Missouri Botanic Garden, came and visited Q and took measurements and, and built an exact copy of the Q Museum. It, that has now been reopened as the Saps Museum at the Missouri Botanic Garden. You can see some of the new displays there. It has a, a really active uh, both uh, display program, but also curation and acquisitions uh, program. And other collections have started in Naples, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, fantastic collection in Yunnan, um, uh, under the creatorship of, of Bob Bai and others uh, at the Botanic Garden in Mexico City. Um, so the, the time for these historic collections has, has really cut, come back. This is, is the right time to be working with this material, because people want to hear those stories. Um, but this uh, graph here, compiled by Caroline, uh, really shows very nicely the kind of uh, history of the Kew Museum and more broadly of such collections. But it starts in 1847. Uh, you can see huge numbers of, uh, these are not numbers of individual items. These are arrivals of, of batches of items. It might be one item. More often it's thousands of items. Um, and you see that from 1847, really up to the First World War, up to 1914, there's a lot of material coming in. And a lot of that material is coming in that pink strip there from South Asia, from, from British India. And then there's a steep fall, which comes even steeper in the 1930s. And what's happening there is that other institutes, like the Imperial Forest Institute, are taking on that role from Kew, and Kew is turning into the Biodiversity Research Institute that you'd recognise today. Now, we've always kept working useful plants going at Kew. We've always kept the Economic Botany Museum uh, going. We're still adding uh, around about 2,000 items a year at the moment to, to the collection. But the level of activity is very different to what it was in the 19th century. And that represents a change in the function of Q. But we no longer serve industry in the direct way. We no longer serve empire, of course, in the same way that we did in the 19th century. And this created a problem in the 20th century for the economic botany collection. Uh, but it, it no longer had that role of acting between the producers of plant materials around the world and manufacturers in prison. So what, what can you do with that collection? So in the first half of the 20th century, it turned into educational resource, uh, into school parties, for example. Um, uh, then it was moved uh, into the research store, uh, and things really went uh, quite quiet until my predecessor at Kew, Hugh Prendergast, uh, initiated work on understanding the history of the collections, and that's really the theme that we've carried on uh, since then. And this is really the central theme of my talk. How do you take a collection that's lost its purpose, that was heavily criticised in the, the mid-20th century as being a, a waste of space, just a, a random uh, Back, uh, acquired by, by travellers. Uh, how do you repurpose that kind of collection uh, for the 21st century? And I'm going to talk about three different ways of doing that. Uh, so one is uh, the Ecoic Bochny collection, and I'm going to talk about Q, but this could apply to any collection anywhere in the world, uh, is a microcosm of global history. So bear in mind that if you think about the, the key material that defines the 20th century is probably oil. If you think about all of the invasions, the uh, coups, the uh, uh, economic influence of, of Rockefeller and so on, oil is the dominant material of the 20th century. What is the dominant material of the 
19th century, it's plant materials, it's uh, food, of course, comes from plants, clothing, as today comes from plants, medicine comes from plants, materials such as rubber or gutter percha or timber come from plants. And so governments in the 19th century understood that plants were a strategic and important material. And that's why Q has such a central role in the story of British trade and commerce and of the British Empire. This is why you can use this kind kind of collection, not only to study, for example, the history of Q, but in principle, the history of the world. Plants are at the centre of everything today, but even more so in the 19th century. The second way, and perhaps I think the most important way that we repurpose the collection, is understanding that in the 19th century, the purpose of such collections was to, as part of a process of extracting wealth from the rest of the world. Uh, in the 21st century, we need to think about how can we return the knowledge, uh, the, the, the indigenous knowledge and understanding that's locked up in European collections back to source communities. And that, of course, is a matter of partnership. Uh, and of bringing together uh, skills from uh, indigenous knowledge uh, and from Western science and trying to use those together. It's not easy, it's challenging work, but it's well worth doing. And I'll talk about a couple of examples of that. And then the third area, which I've already alluded to, is the potential of this kind of collection for public engagement. And there is a knack, you know, unfortunately, plant material, when it's dry, it's mostly brown coloured doesn't look amazing and exciting unless it's been dyed. Uh, and so storytelling is a really, really important part of bringing these collections back to life. Uh, and just here's an example um, that Abdul uh, alluded to, a book written with a PhD student, uh, Kim Walker, Just a Tonic, A Natural History of Tonic Water, a book in which uh, India, which is where the gin and tonic came together, uh, plays a, a really important uh, part. Uh, and this book was a really great opportunity to take a uh, a complicated story that brings together you know, social history of drink, it brings together medicine, uh, brings together uh, colonial botany, uh, brings together the history of malaria, uh, into a relatively light touch and, and readable form, and it seems to have hit that spot. And really, I, I want to give a shout out here to a particular paper, uh, Nature Red in Black and White, Decolonial Approaches to Interpreting Natural History Collections. Uh, this is an open access paper. If you Google the title, you'll, you'll find it very easily. It's published in the Journal of Natural Science Collections, uh, Volume 6. Uh, and this has been a highly influential paper. Subhadra Das is, uh, was a museum curator at University College London and a historian of science. And Miranda Lowe is a curator of corals at the Natural History Museum in London. Now, of course, we, uh, our understanding of how botanists and other natural scientists have worked hand in hand with uh, empire is not a new subject. There's a huge amount of academic work on this, and there has been uh, since the late 1970s. This is a, a widely discussed uh, subject, but it would be not true to say this is a widely discussed subject in natural history museums. There's been a gap between the academic discourse and the, the many uh, books and papers and what you'll actually see in the display if you walk into a natural history museum. There's a real uh, failure to acknowledge history there. And there's also uh, you know, a failure to tell really important stories, uh, interesting stories, uh, in particular stories that explain a lot about the world that we live in today, the answers lie in our recent past in, in the 19th century. So this is a short and very readable paper, and what it does is to bridge that gap between the wider academic work and what takes place in museums. And I'm not going to talk about the wider academic context of our work at Kew. There is a, a lot of uh, theoretical work um, uh, and detailed archive studies underpinning it, done both by people linked to Q and the, the wider community of historians of science. Uh, but that body of work is really important to everything that we do here. And every project that we do now, uh, we are um, bearing this paper in mind uh, and thinking in not only what questions should we be asking, but how are we asking them? Who is asking those questions? Uh, are we building in uh, um, 
uh, fair access uh, um, uh, to our to our collections and to our research and to our projects. So coming to the first set of work around global history, uh, a major project that we've just finished, uh, working with Felix Driver and Caroline Cornish at Royal Holloway, University of London, who have been uh, fantastic collaborative partners for the last 15 years or so, was looking at the circulation of ethnobotany collections in the 19th century. So what you've got here in this graph is you've got the brown line, which shows material coming into Q. We, we already saw this graph before. And the blue line, something more surprising, is specimens going out of Q. And this is the number of events again. So when it says 100 events, that translates into perhaps 5,000 objects leaving Q. And this is an overlooked but very common feature of 19th century museums, but they acted as what historians of science would call centers of circulation. Material came in, material went out. Uh, and this came out through the practice of collecting uh, duplicates. So those of you who are uh, herbarium botanists uh, will be very familiar when you collect a plant out in the wild, you don't just collect one specimen, you collect four or five or ten from the same population. And they you press them, they take them back to your herbarium, and then those are sent out to other herbaria around the world. And this is the main way that herbarium collections at Kew and elsewhere is built up, is by exchange with other institutions. Uh, the same practice occurred at the British Museum, uh, same practice occurred in the Museum of Economic Botany. So for example, someone who was collecting perhaps coconut fibre shoes uh, on a uh, Pacific atoll would collect four pairs of those shoes. That creates eight items that can be distributed around the world, retaining uh, one at Kew. And it raises, of course, a lot of really interesting questions of cultural objects. Can you really talk about duplicates or not? The fact is, in the 19th century, they were treated as duplicates. And this element of museums taking things in and sending them out again has really only been quite recently worked on by historians. And we discovered during this project that there's similar work going on with archaeology museums, uh, for example. Uh, so we were able to meet this map here shows uh, the museums around the world, uh, overall uh, uh, several hundred, but Q sent material to. Uh, here's an example of how duplicates work. Um, so this is an uh, uh, Echinops um, scrapings from the stems that are used for tinder. So this is very light material. And you see here the Q specimen, the Q uh, printed label. And then you can see a sample. The sample has been split. Uh, and material has also been sent to the Museum of Economic Botany in Brisbane, where it still sits in the Queensland Museum. Uh, so we made a number of trips tracking down where these objects had gone to, and what happened to them on their journeys. How were they reinterpreted? What knowledge was was gained or lost uh, during uh, those journeys. And taking the example uh, of uh, Sydney, uh, we looked at how material flowed into the Sydney Museum of Economic Botany via Q. And you can see, in fact, that the largest amount of material here is from India. Uh, so what's happening is that uh, material flows from India to the East India Company Museum in London. When that museum shuts in 1879, uh, the plant collections come to Kew. Uh, Kew makes a special building to split up this enormous collection and sends parts of it to museums all over, over the world, including a large amount of material to, to Sydney. So India to East India Company Museum to Kew Museum, from Kew Museum to Sydney. So though the map shows the flow of material uh, directly from India, it's an indirect journey to Britain and then back to uh, Australia. But there are similar flows of material from South America, uh, from uh, North America, from, from West Africa, and so on. So this is all part of uh, a way of, of sharing knowledge. So uh, you know, a really important role of botany in the 18th and 19th century is mapping the natural resources of the world, making those available for exploitation. Uh, and that was done partly through journal papers, partly through books, partly through herbarium specimens, but also through economic botany collections. 
and the results of that work have been published in a series of papers and an open access book. If you Google mobile museums, you'll find our website and everything that we did in this project is published open access and all the data is uh, freely available as well. And as part of this project, we were also able to digitize our museum entry books, the accession registers for the museum, and put those up uh, online. And so this is one element of this kind of work, uh, of decolonizing work, is transparency. It's not sufficient by itself, but it's a really important start, is making data about your collection available to anybody else out in the world to use and interrogate. Uh, and the fact that we're able to digitize and put online onto the Biodiversity Heritage Library, accession registers has of course been incredibly helpful for us in the last two years. Um, so another example of global history is, as I referred to before, the story of Cinchona, the tree that has the bark that's the source of uh, quinine. Uh, here the work has been led by two PhD students. You see here uh, Kim Walker photographing some of our bark collection, um, and then not in the photograph, uh, Natalie Canale is based at the University of Copenhagen. And this is a, a twin streamed uh, PhD, with Kim using our collections, the, the objects as her primary source of evidence, uh, and archives as well, uh, and then Natalie extracting DNA and chemistry from our historic uh, Centurion collection, and then bringing those two sources of information together. Um, and uh, this chart drawn up by Kim gives you a sense of of what, why is Cinchona and Quinine such an interesting story? And the interest lies, of course, in that Cinchona trees grow in the eastern slopes of the Andes in South America. And so this is the main source and the main area of research shown by the peak there in the 19th, 18th and 19th century. Um, but in the 1860s, key botanists transfer the seeds and plants of Cinchona to India, uh, later on to Java. Uh, and then you get a shift to research in India on how to grow cinchona in an entirely new environment to produce quinine in the most effective way. And the kind of intersection between those two was work, we think, on the botany and chemistry of Kew, carried out in London by a pharmaceutical manufacturer, uh, Howard's, uh, John Elliott Howard, of Howard's and Sons. And this is the main subject of, of Kim's uh, PhD. And it was that integration of botany and chemistry that allowed uh, accurate bioprospecting and the effective transfer, which have been tried many times before, of course, of cinchona trees from South America uh, to India. Uh, and you can see that pattern represented really well. We have about a thousand barks uh, in the Q collection from Cinchona. Uh, and uh, of those, around about three quarters are wild collected uh, from South America. So we've lost the colors uh, on this pie chart. 22% uh, are from colonial plantations. It's mainly from India. And then there's a small amount of Dutch and uh, other material. Uh, Kim has also worked on the uh, equivalent economic botany collection in Leiden, at Naturalis, where the picture is reversed. Around about three quarters of the specimens come from uh, Indonesia, uh, from, from Dutch uh, uh, colonial times, and a much smaller amount of material comes from the uh, wild wild uh, forests in the Andes. And you can see here the kind of work that John Ellett Howard is doing in the mid 19th century. Uh, he's analyzing the specimens. You can see the four different quinine uh, figures there. And then noting all of the information, the traders marks, the local names, then trying to apply that in names to these, trying to crack the code of these specimens. And so it's a really great opportunity with, with this project to do two things. Uh, one is to reassess a really important part of a big story in colonial botany that's not been fully told. But this material is also really important in that the Cinchona forests no longer exist. You only find young trees growing now. Uh, the debilitating effects of harvesting the 19th century and then in the Second World War are still felt. Um, so if you want to understand the chemical ecology of quinine, why do Cinchona trees produce quinine alkaloids in the first place? You can't simply go back to Cinchona forests and collect fresh material, you have to go into historic collections. There's a virtual uh, circle here 
between uh, historical research, which needs you to better understand collections, and scientific research, let's say biological research, uh, where it's really helpful if your specimens are well provenanced, if you know where they're from, who collected them, and what date they were collected. That information is often missing. But through historical research, you can add that information. So this is a really good example of a historical project with a, 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 a biological and humanities part, two PhD students, uh, but will feed into supporting science research for the next few centuries. Um, and just to, to wrap up the story here, uh, these are some of the collecting locations uh, for the seeds and plants uh, taken to, to India and to Java uh, from South America. Uh, here you can see the environmental impact of the uh, Cinchona tree plantations in the Nilgiri Hills in, in India. And here you can see the packets by which uh, quinine was distributed through Indian post offices for the smallest uh, Indian coin uh, of the time. Uh, and this uh, increased here showing what happens when you plant you know, plantations. It's very reminiscent of the pictures that you see today. We're thinking about oil palm, for example, in Indonesia. And it's a really important reminder that when you're sitting in a collection or an archive in, in Kew or in Kolkata um, or in New York, uh, but what you're reading, what you're seeing in the objects, what you're reading in the archives has a real life impact, not just on the environment, but of course, these plantations needed to be staffed. There were major population movements for indentured labor um, uh, to, to staff these plantations, often mountainous environments with relatively low populations, uh, and no workforce available. Uh, and so I've become increasingly interested in environmental history as a, a big framework uh, for this kind of work. And of course, particularly in nations of the Anthropocene, that are really starting to enter environmental history. Um, there's a lot of other work going on on materials in the collection. There's a whole project uh, on tea, but I didn't have time to talk about. But I do just want to make a brief stop on dye plants because we've got two developing lines of work on, on Indian collections uh, here. Uh, so one is the amazing story of Indian yellow. So this is a really important dye up to about 1900, uh, used by painters uh, in Europe, uh, but was obtained by feeding mango the to cattle uh, in large quantities, collecting the urine uh, and then condensing the, the dye uh, out of that. Uh, and for many centuries, people didn't know where this dye came from. Uh, and the problem was cracked by uh, Tien uh, Mukherjee, uh, an amazing uh, Indian scientist, I think still the very uh, undervalued uh, character uh, who, who, who deserves a lot more work on, on their accomplishments uh, and on their life. Um, who uh, visited uh, the town where Indian yellow was produced, uh, observed how it was made, uh, collected the, the pot in which it was collected, uh, the cloth in which it was strained, then lumps of the raw dye. So this is now a really uh, original, excellent evidence. Uh, and he published a paper on it in Q Bulletin, the Bulletin of Miscellaneous Information. Uh, and these collections have been analysed by, by chemists and they have exactly the right uh, characteristics you would expect uh, for the way in which they're made. So the mystery of, of uh, Indian yellow was cracked uh, in 1890 by an Indian scientist. But a book came out about 10 years ago uh, on dyes and colours that cast doubt on this story and suggested that Mukherjee's uh, work uh, could not be trusted. Uh, and that is now a, a widespread story uh, out there uh, on the uh, internet. Uh, and I think that that's a, a real pity and it's important to get back into the record. Uh, just how thorough and careful this work was, uh, how the specimens that he collected and Mukti was a uh, collected a lot of material for Q uh, is still here. It's, it's, it's still a really important part of his uh, scientific uh, legacy. And then just to very briefly mention, we have a new project to a PhD student, uh, Vivi Melika, uh, with, again with Royal Holloway, uh, working on the uh, 
uh, reintroduction of indigo production uh, in Bengal. So this is a, a long-standing uh, traditional industry that came to an end in about 1900 when synthetic indigo became uh, available. And this model of the indigo factory at Kew is now a replica of this at the headquarters of the Botanical Survey of India in Kolkata. Um, shows you uh, how it was made. The uh, craft has been revived as a you know, very high value, high quality craft industry. We have matching collections made by Jenny Balfour Paul, the world's leading expert on indigo production. So there's a really great opportunity here. Uh, and Bibi is a filmmaker, doing a PhD by practice, uh, to work uh, together with the uh, uh, village, uh, the new village industries, uh, looking at our archives and seeing what information can we bring from our archives that can help and support the revival of this industry. So this brings me very neatly then to working uh, with source communities. Uh, and so here we're looking at the work of Richard Spruce, who spent uh, 14 years in the Amazon and in the Andes, uh, carrying the travels. You can just see in red there, right through the two branches of the Amazon, up here into the Rio Negro, the Northwest Amazon area I'll be talking about. And what was special about Richard Spruce was that he collected about 14,000 herbarium specimens that are the foundation of Western botanical understanding of the Amazon. Um, uh, he uh, collected about 300 ethnobotanical objects that are the subject of our current project. Uh, he took very detailed notes, notebooks, he wrote a lot of letters. Uh, he did the first portraits of named people in the Amazon. So he was an intensely curious and sympathetic uh, observer of life in the Amazon. Um, and we realised there was an opportunity here, uh, working with William Milliken, who's a leading Amazonian ethnobotanist at Kew, uh, Luciana Martins, a cultural historian, art historian at Birkbeck, University of London, uh, with colleagues at Rio de Janeiro Botanic Garden, uh, ESA, the Social Environmental Institute, the big NGO for Indigenous Peoples, and with the Federation of Indigenous Peoples in the Rio Negro. Uh, and this is very typical of how you do this kind of work. If you're going to interdisciplinary disciplinary work. One person cannot do this. I absolutely need collaborators who are experts in the various uh, fields. And of course, in a project that's working with Indigenous collections, that must include Indigenous uh, collaborators. Uh, so for the last five years or so, we've been developing for a series of small projects leading to a bigger project. We've been asking the question, how can you use this historic collection of objects? to uh, support Indigenous peoples in an area that's not heavily threatened by deforestation, but is threatened by cultural erosion, a lot of problems with uh, health, uh, for example, a lot of problems with the valuation of Indigenous knowledge. So this project really had two parts. So one was uh, understanding the collections, so again, uh, but quite basic historical work. And where does the material come from? Who collected it? Where did they collect it from? Now, a big breakthrough here was realizing that the ethnobotany specimens, and this is a psychoactive snuff, so these beans here, had a number on. The herbarium specimens had a number, different number. If you look at the notes, uh, you can find that the specimen number and the herbarium sheet number are cross-connected. So in 1850, uh, Richard Spruce was collecting vulture specimens. So when he collected an ethnobotanic artifact, he also collected a herbarium specimen to show what plant it was. That did not come standard practice in ethnobotany until the 1980s. I only wish that Richard Spruce had published his methodology and we had adopted it earlier. It's really only through digital means, by digital all of this to make it easy to work with when putting the data into a spreadsheet, but we realized that this connection exists. So we're now able to much better understand Spruce's collections, then that's been the basis of work with uh, the uh, indigenous peoples in the Northwest Amazon, uh, looking at objects such as the shield that are no longer made, uh, quivers and arrows are made, uh, but in different ways, uh, these bark cloth shirts are, are made. Uh, it's, a, it's a complex picture of surviving knowledge, vanishing knowledge, but sitting within an intact system of cosmology. Uh, and so the aim of the project, which is very much a, a joint project, 
is about using uh, if you like, both sets of techniques in Western science. So we've been asked to teach botanical illustration, how to make an environment specimen, and how to use a digital camera, combining that with an indigenous perspective such as cosmology, which lead to a pretty fundamental reinterpretation of some of the Q uh, specimens. And you can see the work taking place where uh, in the Amazon, uh, there's Luciana Martins, uh, uh, and then here at, at Kew Gardens, uh, you see many of our collaborators and Lindsay, who's an artist carrying out a PhD uh, uh, on this work as well. Um, and what was really exciting in this work uh, here in London uh, was to see the objects reanimated. So soon after that picture was taken, the shield was picked up and worn on someone's arm. A maraca, a shaker that hadn't been shaken for 150 years, was shaken. The same occurred at the British Museum, the same occurred in Berlin. Uh, it was a quite extraordinary experience to see objects coming back, back to life. And that concept of these being living collections, uh, collections that contain uh, spirits and living connections to communities is a really, really important area that museums need to take on board, and which do in fact change the way you look after collections. Uh, for the last 18 months, the project's been working through Zoom conversations. Uh, it's been slow, but that slowness has been quite useful in developing some of those conversations. Then here are two of the outputs of the project. This uh, from the um, uh, in the longhouse, the maloka, between artifacts and plants. So that idea of ethnobotany collections, raw materials and finished products. Uh, this is a book that we've distributed free for use in schools in the Rio Negro area uh, with lesson plans and a game. Uh, and then this is a manual again distributed in Portuguese and two local languages in the Rio Negro region on how to do ethnobotany. And that includes, of course, how to find your heritage in museums and other parts of the world, other parts of Brazil, other parts of uh, Europe, uh, and how to work with visiting ethnobotanists. Uh, and then a new example, and just to discuss uh, very briefly, this is a new project working with the Transdisciplinary University of Medical Sciences in Bengaluru, a really exciting project, looking at what happened to the Materia Medica, to the drugs that were displayed in the old East India Company Museum in the centre of London, uh, and how do they sit within the big body of written work by East India Company surgeons, uh, and also local healers, uh, published in India in the 19th century. And overall at Q, we have uh, around about 5,000 specimens of Indian Materia Medica, um, uh, and uh, of which about 500 are from the East India Company Museum. We're studying this uh, as an assemblage, uh, and this is a, a very much a, a joint and equal project with TDU. Uh, so a really important element about is access to the collections. And you can see here uh, Erin, our uh, digitizer, uh, hard at work. This is about a quarter of a way now through the 5,000 specimens. We're about to, to, to start work on, on that first uh, batch of images. And so by sharing the images uh, freely, um, and these are, are freely available uh, worldwide, uh, it makes it possible to study the material worldwide. We're looking forward to exchange visits uh, in, in both uh, directions. Uh, but this is a project that's very well adapted to the COVID era, but puts digitized images and archives right at the center of the project. And we're really interested in two things here. One, how did British surgeons and um, uh, Indian medicine and uh, drug suppliers interact in the 19th century? How did information flow? What was the influence in, in both directions? And then using that as a springboard to ask the same question about the 21st century. It was a really interesting time for Ayurvedic medicine, where there are moves, uh, particularly led by TDU, to integrate Ayurvedic medicine and, and Western biomedicine in, in India. Uh, and then uh, Ayurvedic medicine has a, a complex position uh, in the UK. Uh, so many of the same questions arose in the 19th century are uh, arising today about you know, the validity, about the identity, about the naming, about the authentication uh, of these uh, medicines. So it's a really exciting project that's just uh, really starting to, to accelerate. 
Um, and then to end a little bit on, on public engagement and uh, just how useful this material is uh, for that purpose. Um, so you can see here on, on the right, the uh, museum number two, you saw the photographs much earlier. Uh, today it's our School of Horticulture, it's a teaching area. We've been able to take it over twice in 2011 and 2019 uh, and use it for a weekend of what's called London Open House, where many historic properties are uh, open free of charge uh, to the public. And you can see here historic material out uh, on tables. Uh, we've chosen the things like baskets that we know will survive the changes in humidity you get in this kind of environment. And then we'll be different uh, PhD students, master's students, volunteers, uh, and staff at each table explaining and talking about the objects. And this kind of material, it bears rich interpretation, simply putting us in the case of a small label no longer does it. You, we need to think of ways of, of enriching and, and telling these stories. Um, and then you can see here part of our work on the left uh, linked to the mobile museum project I talked about earlier. Um, we found that Kew has sent out plant material in the 19th century to about 600 schools uh, around the UK. Uh, and the reason for that was to make this kind of display. So this is showing raw materials from around the empire, and then how you see these in, in the shop. So here you've got wheat and barley, and then you'll have down here wheat and barley uh, products, uh, corn, uh, 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 cereals and, and porridge oats and, and so on. Um, and of course, the purpose at that time, it was partly uh, you know, uh, biological uh, education, but there was also an element there of uh, no, um, uh, uh, appreciating or, or praising the empire. Mm -hmm. We wondered if that kind of display could be repurposed to a very different 21st century London. So we worked with uh, two primary schools in London, uh, both chosen for the uh, diversity of their students. Um, and we've uh, uh, and both museums set up temporary exhibitions, temporary museums, using material brought from their homes. And we just published a paper on this work. It was really fantastic. So this is not about using plant material to teach botany. This is plant material cross-curricular, again, taking out interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach, uh, understanding you can use plants to talk about anything. Uh, and we got particular uh, uh, appreciation, if you like, from uh, parents and, and uh, teachers and pupils about intergenerational transfer. The, this was a project that you could take home and use to talk to your parents or your grandparents about objects sitting uh, around the house. We think there's a lot of potential to extend that work. So I wanted to end with this picture that I took just a few weeks ago, because I think it, it sums up a, a lot of how we're working with these collections. Uh, we hosted a workshop for eight basket makers and an anthropologist and a mathematician. Uh, uh, and um, this, I took this picture at lunchtime one day when uh, everyone was uh, out of the room. And what you can see here is historic artifacts uh, from the collection. We're not shy to get these out and to use them, but we, we do teach people how to uh, handle them. Uh, you can see here, for example, an eel trap uh, from, from Japan. Uh, you've got here uh, fresh uh, raw materials. Uh, some of these harvested in Kew Gardens, especially for the workshop, the basket makers' tools as they responded to what they were looking at. And the mathematician was leading us thinking about curves, thinking about tension, uh, thinking uh, about structure. And then you can also see here a series of photographs of baskets being made, uh, books, uh, sketchbooks, uh, a, a classic uh, Mabelis plant book, uh, you know, all of the uh, kind of information resources that a botanic garden has and bringing those uh, to bear. So I think this kind of sums up really well, actually, how you can bring these historic collections, and this applies not only to economic botany collections, but to herbaria, and to library, and to uh, archives, and to living plant collections as well. Uh, how do you make them speak? Uh, and the, the way to, that they can speak is by bringing together the, the right people of all of those different skills are in the room, the museum creator, the botanist, the anthropologist, the mathematician, and crucially, the, the makers, the people who are really experienced in, in and uh, handling the, the uh, crafts. So it was a really uh, inspiring uh, and exciting day. 
And I'm going to end there just by saying that if you're interested in learning more about these projects, uh, you do visit my webpage. It's got some information about them, a little bit out of date, but the page that is up to date there is the publications page. You can download almost everything as a PDF uh, to read. You can follow me on Twitter, and I talk quite a lot about my work there. And feel free also to email me with any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mark, uh, for that really interesting talk. Um, I'm sure all our um, participants enjoyed your talk thoroughly. I indeed enjoyed it, right from the fascinating visuals that you showed to uh, some of the concepts of um, moving from botanical collections to living collections, uh, where you sort of reminded us um, as to why ethnobotany was so fascinating for communities when you interact with plants and how much fun it is. And uh, there's this entire intergeneration, intergenerational transfer that you're creating again, um, basically to uh, continue the um, traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge and giving way to sort of evolving uh, the entire ethnobotanical uh, practices. So thank you so much for uh, taking us on that uh, lovely journey of botanical collections and the way forward. So uh, we have uh, some time for questions. Uh, there are two ways, either participants can uh, type out their questions or uh, you can directly ask uh, questions to uh, Mark. Uh, so if anyone would want to ask questions, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. Maybe I would have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, Vinik, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mark, very much for your for your impressive presentation. Uh, I have one uh, uh, one question because I I um, have read your article which you published in 2010 in Journal of Food Composition and Analysis. It was about the <clears throat> Uh, linking biodiversity, food and nutrition, and the importance of plant identifications. Uh, yep. I think it was uh, it it was very important paper in that uh, even for the uh, for us who who work in agriculture. Uh, maybe uh, and and you found uh, in this paper several deficiencies in in uh, in quite a significant proportion of the papers you analyzed. Uh, and the uh, with the identification of the plants and nomenclature, uh, did you uh, <clears throat> somewhat uh, checked how this trend was was uh, 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 was improved in the in the past decade, or or if what you, uh, uh, what do you see? Because because we as a um, uh, taxonomist, we are. Uh, quite often criticized for that the nomenclature is quite often changing and 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 so on. But uh, uh, but what you uh, uh, recommend for the for the for the young scientists, for example, young, uh, starting the, their their PhDs and uh, 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 in that uh, in that way, I understand that you 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 explained quite a. Uh, uh, Extend extendly uh, in your in your paper how to what 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 is the best practice but um, what uh, uh, trends you see in that uh, in that way. Uh, yeah, no, thank thank you. Yes, so in that paper we we looked very closely at papers on wild foods and we were curious as to who was identifying the plants in those papers uh, and it's very hard to find that information uh, you know so there's a number of things we, we should be looking for we should in an ideal world be hoping that herbarium specimens are being kept 
fading that photographs would be a help. Uh, we're looking for the name of the person who actually did the uh, identification. Uh, and then we're looking for evidence that they, whoever did the identification did a good job. Uh, and we found a lot of very out of date names. Some names have not been used for 100 years. Uh, we found a lot of names that are misspelt. And this gave us a very low competence uh, uh, rating. And because most people do not collect herbarium specimens, you can't check the identifications uh, anyhow. Uh, all of this work was inspired by a classic paper by Bob Bai in Mexico, published in 1984 in, I think, Journal of Ethnobiology on vulture specimens in, in ethnobiology and this importance of collecting, if possible, a herbarium specimen. If you're collecting things like crude drugs, there are, there are different ways to do that. You can simply collect a jar of a crude drug and define that as, as a specimen. Um, so it's a good question. Have things got any better? So in ethnobotany, you 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 would find it difficult to publish a paper now without addressing this problem. So either you're expected to collect herbarium specimens. If for some reason you can't do that, there's maybe there's a legal problem, or you're working with you know, away from where the plants grow, uh, then you're expected to to justify your identifications. Uh, in the world of food composition and other areas, it would make a great project for a student to, uh, maybe a master's student to, or undergraduate even, uh, to, to have a look and, and see. I, I'm not very optimistic, uh, but at least <laughs> at least it's, it's out there for, for people who'd like to read it. But I think it, it brings me to a wider point, which is that, uh, you know, we, we botanists, I think probably everybody in this call is a botanist in one way or another. We, we have a powerful technical tool, but uh, by, you know, when you allocate a Linnaean name to a plant, a botanical name, you're, it's like, a, as people often say, it's like a passport to the wider world of plant information. Uh, and when you don't do that, then, then you, you can't make that link. And so I find it very frustrating, for example, that uh, museums, uh, if, you, if you see some beautiful uh, basket in a museum and you look at the label, it'll say made from vegetable fibers or seeds. Now that, that's the level of identification. So we've actually just started a, a new project uh, working in three different museums in Britain, including Kew, uh, which is bringing together indigenous peoples uh, botanists uh, uh, and museum curators to look together at material from Australia, from Somalia, uh, and from the Amazon to see if we can each bring our technical expertise to bear on collections at the same time. Uh, I think that will produce quite a exciting results. So you know, as, as people who know about botany and can uh, apply botanical names, it's a really important technical skill. It's just disappointing that there should be, you know, all, all of these people working in wild food should be knocking on your door, getting bringing you in as collaborators right at the start of projects. And that's still, I think, probably not happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, Kim, I can see you've raised your hand. Uh, you can go ahead. Uh, hello, this is actually Ukash with Kim, and, but I had a question. Oh, hi, hello. Um, hi. hello. I uh, have a question, Mark, maybe a stupid one, but um, how do you think, is it better to expand the existing economic uh, botany museums or to like encourage people to create a network of smaller museums or maybe rather make like specialized collections like bark you know like uh, uh, baskets or you know what's your intuition i would say yeah so i think this question of how you build a collection but, but both answers are, are correct so some of the most valuable collections that have come to queue have been lifetime collections by one person so i'm thinking of you know, the jenny balfour paul indigo collection it, it's amazing it's, it's, it's an incredible collection not only is it very rich uh, in, in dyes but the documentation is very high standard or everything's been published so lots of photographs so really great uh, uh, notebooks but what happens when a collector uh, you know dies 
you know, it's a hard question to ask, but it's an important question. And what usually happens is that everything goes into, uh, well, what we'd call a skip, one of these giant rubbish bins that comes when you're emptying a house and everything is lost. If material does go to a museum, it goes without the data because the data is in the head of the person who's no longer around to share it. So I think there's a lot to be said for making pers either personal collections or you know, small institutional collections. But we have to recognise that people and small institutions are fragile uh, and that often bigger institutions uh, can for purity, long-term access, uh, digitization, and so on and so forth. So I, there's a happy medium, but uh, I, I think we've seen the same with seed banks, for example, but there's been a move in the last two decades to community seed banks, which are absolutely fantastic, but they are backed up by a network of international seed banks that work in a very different way. And there's a flow of seeds in both directions between the two. So I, I think if you like having the smaller collections, but with close connections with big collections is, is the way to work. And that's the way that museums are going more and more. You're seeing the partnering of big museums and small museums. So we're not a big museum. Our, our collections, it's only two people, but that's more than most other collections. Uh, but we have, for example, run courses uh, for colleagues both in Brazil uh, and in Europe on you know, how to bring, how to, to, to arrive at, a, let's say, a standardized high quality curation methods. So I think there's a lot of skill sharing, if you like, but can be done in both directions. Yeah, I just want to add one more point on this, uh, the same thing which Kim has answered. Uh, we had a project uh, of having a small ethnic museums in uh, uh, three or four states of India. Uh, and uh, till the project was surviving, uh, the museum really was very useful. Many people, community came into it. But once the project stopped and, the, and there was not much of the funding to the institution, uh, it slowly started uh, uh, diminishing the, the collections, the thing went on, the herbarium, the rotors, the, the different uh, ethnobotanical things that we had slowly start. Uh, maintenance was not there because the fund of maintenance was not there. And wherever the, uh, the the main collections were there with hatch fund and which could do it, we surveyed a lot. Yeah, this is one of the experiences that I'll share. Yeah. yeah. So pa partnerships are, are, I think, really the yeah. way ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if we have any other questions, uh, participants can, uh, I hope we can take one more question if there is. If not, we can stop here. No questions? Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining today uh, to be a part of uh, this wonderful talk. Um, and as we continue this series, uh, we thank you for your active participation. Um, uh, just a small request if everyone could switch on their videos so we can quickly take a group picture. That's the least we could do to socialize a little bit and uh, know that uh, we are part of a community. Uh, so let's take the picture. I'll just wait for a few seconds till everybody switches their camera on. Yeah, I'd also like to thank Bob for really oh. connecting me to Mark for this uh, very good, wonderful lecture. Oh. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Bob, for connecting us to Mark. It was indeed a wonderful uh, And just to a shout out from me to Viviana Krill, who I, I can see is here, uh, who is our, our absolutely key partner at Rio de Janeiro Botanic Garden in the work in, in the uh, Amazon. So I, I could only present a, a very small part of that work, but it's, it's a really exciting project and I'm really looking forward to developing that. Okay, and so I can see most of you have switched on your cameras, so I will be taking the picture the count of uh, three. So uh, keep your smiles ready. So one, two, and three. I'll take a few more. One query. Yeah. Uh, that regarding the participation certificate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I will mail you about it. We'll give you, don't worry about that. No worries. 
I have, I have already given the mail to Abdul sir. Two, two, two. Done, done, done. No issues. So thank you so much everyone for joining us today. I will be sending you the recording uh, uh, via email. And if you have any other queries, kindly mail me. Thank you so much, Professor Mark, again for your time today. And uh, see you again, all of you, for our next uh, series talk, which I will be emailing you shortly about. Thank you so much for joining. Have a wonderful day and take good care of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Very nice. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.